introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, just just one moment before I do that, though, I'm going to uh, make just a couple of announcements. First, uh, how many of you have heard about Opportunity Quest? Okay, business plan competition. I'll share more detail with you, but uh, if you're interested in an opportunity to earn some a thousand dollars of of prize money, uh, competing with your peers just here at Snow College, uh, you'll want to be starting to think about a business idea that you would like to share uh, as part of that competition. You don't have to complete a, a full business plan, but you do have to have kind of a summary of your idea. And uh, the application packet has all of the details and I will, in Canvas, share more information about that with you. And I would encourage all of you to do that. In addition to the money, it's worth a lot of extra credit in this class. So if you've missed a class or two or you're, you're missing some points, you may want to consider that. Uh, also, speaking about your grade, I've been marking the attendance based on the sheets that you turn in. And the way that Canvas works when I click uh, a check mark for green, it gives you attendance points. If I don't check, check the mark for red, it doesn't say you've missed. And I have not been checking red for those who have missed. So if you're wondering why you had 100% attendance even though you only come half the time, that's why. And you really don't have 100% because now I've gone in and checked the red for all of those who weren't here. So if you're looking at your grade, uh, it'll now have a more accurate reflection of that and you won't get credit for the days that you weren't here. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's guest speaker. Mr. Mike Barclay founded Barclay Welding in Paul, Idaho in 1980. Within five years, the company had evolved to become Barclay Mechanical and began servicing agricultural processing plants throughout the U.S. And in 1991, he moved his family to Manti, Utah. And there started Barclay Mechanical Services of Utah, a sister company to the Idaho business. He developed welding procedures uh, for several varieties of metal and completed necess the necessary certifications to perform specialty welding. And today they specialize in heavy industrial construction, piping and pressure vessels, as well as food processing and petrochemical specialty welding. Barclay Mechanical crews work across Utah, Idaho, and throughout the United States. Uh, the Idaho company was sold to its employees in 2005, and in January of 2012, Mike sold the Utah company to three of his sons, Kenneth, Scott, and John. He remained with Barclay Mechanical Services as a business consultant. Mike and his wife, Susan, love spending time with their children and grandchildren. They enjoy the outdoors, camping and hunting. Uh, service in the church, their church and community are important to them. Mike and his wife recently returned from three years of church service in Bulgaria. Mike has been a San Pete County search and rescue volunteer for over 15 years, uh, has driven an ambulance for five years, and has served in the South San Pete School Board for 12 years, both as president and vice president. He has been dedicated to active service for the Boy Scouts of America and received the organization's Silver Beaver Award for Distinguished Service. Please welcome Mr. Mike Barclay. My goodness. That, yeah, that did sound like an obituary. I'm old, but I still have a young heart. Grateful to be here with you today. And I just wanted to start, just take two answers. Why did you come to this class? And what are you hoping to gain from it? Quickly. Anybody? Why did you come? Okay. What are you trying to gain? Learn from the best. I am too. I started this business when I was 26 years old. I don't know if you, I'll just give you an idea. I tried everything. I tried to get into medical school. There was a time years ago, and you probably won't believe this, but they were limiting the number of white people that could get in to medical school because everything was 
they felt was un unfair for the um, uh, minorities. And so they only allowed a certain number of people into medical school. My brother, just older than I, he is a doctor. Um, I was told that I um, probably wouldn't be able to uh, apply for a year or two. And as I mentioned, when I was here five years ago, the stork kept delivering babies on our doorstep. And they all wanted to be fed. And it was my job to feed them. So I'm the kind of example that you probably don't want to see because you see I worked 40 hours a week when I was trying to graduate from college. Um, you could get by on about six hours sleep and it was a total sacrifice but not just for me. My wife when we started our business, now remember you have to have a, a good accounting department. So not only was she taking care of three children at the age of 21 or 22 years old, but she was also the head of the office, answering phones, changing diapers. It, it was, it's not quite the bed of roses that everybody thinks it is. And for the first several years, we really struggled. I think the thing that really was a big turning point for us in our business was when we started to get contracts for bigger projects. But right before this time, it was 1983, you don't know, do you remember how the thistle junction up here slid, there was big snowstorms, and then we had some flooding, and it was about that time in history. And things were looking really bleak. We didn't have enough money to pay our bills. And um, everybody would bring us equipment or supplies, and I would have to give them a check right then. They wouldn't extend us credit. We had borrowed $88,000, $89,000 to build a new shop, and it was 12 and a quarter percent interest. You know, you're going to think that I'm crazy, but it was 12 and a quarter percent interest. How could anybody make payments on a shop at 12 and a quarter percent? My payment was 1200 and some dollars per month. And when you don't have any money coming in, that's close to a million dollars. You know, you just think, how am I going to come up with that money? But we did. We were able to. Some things happened. And in every business, you've got to have good things happen to be successful. And however you want to attribute that, I attribute that to the blessings of our Creator. If you always are trying your best to be honest, if you're always given a good product, then you can receive help in ways that you don't really understand. Now, at this time, we had developed a little seed grain cart. Now, before then, when farmers were planting their acres and acres and t thousands and tens of thousands of acres of, of wheat, they would buy pallets of bagged, treated seed and they would rip the bags open, dump them in their grain drills, and they'd get about three of them together and rip open the sacks, and the wind would blow the sacks to the fence at the mile away. They'd gather, gather all of the sacks that the wind blew against the fence. But it would take them hours to load the grain drill and then plant the seed. We'd come up with a little nurse cart that would carry 10,000 pounds of seed grain. And rather than pay 27 cents per bag to bag the seed, they would just dump that treated seed bulk. You'd hook up to that little nurse cart, it's just a little square tapered hopper with a tarp on the top, and, and it had an auger that would swing into place. We had a cable inside the pipe, so it, it aligned the augers. You'd clamp them together, you'd start your hydraulic motor, and then you would be able to fill that, that drill. And so the seed companies were able to uh, sell their seed at a lesser price because they didn't have to bag it, but they would still make more money because they didn't have to bag it. And before long, we had sold hundreds of those carts, and we had paid our shop off the 88,000 note at 12 and a quarter percent interest. We'd paid it off in the year, 
and we'd paid our bills to current. You've got to have some things going for you in business, and, and you have to really maximize on those good things. About this time, we also landed a project for the J.R. Simplot Company, and we had about 30 guys that were working inside a food processing plant, and we had to work around the clock because when they shut these potato processing plants down, you're talking, you know, maybe half a million dollars worth of profit in a 24-hour period. So they don't care really what it costs if they have projects that need to be completed so that they can produce french fries. Uh, they'll pay the price. And so you, because we as a service company, they didn't care whether we slept or not. And so we would work around the clock. Well, as we were working and because I didn't have enough trained supervisors, I found myself having to go in every shift and spend some time to line, line up the work. And during this time, I would bought a brand new set of snap-on wrenches. Does anybody know what snap-on tools are? Are they good or what? Probably the best. Well, I was so proud of them, but I'd spend a lot of money. And so I had my toolbox open. Everybody was working. The Simplot employees, my employees, all working out of my tools. And I went to get my 9 16 end wrench, and somebody had stolen my 9 16 snap-on end wrench. Well, I had to have a 9 16 wrench, so I went to the supply at Simplot's, and I borrowed their 9 16 end wrench. This one's mine, by the way, but I, brought, I wanted you to see it. Do you know the biggest challenge for me in my life to that point? I wanted to keep that 9 16 wrench that I borrowed from the supply room at Simplot's. Because I had brought a full set and somebody had stolen mine and it wasn't right that I should go walk away without a wrench. And, uh, oh, that ate me. Can you imagine the pressure that was on me? Because I wanted to keep a wrench that wasn't really mine. Because it wasn't my fault that I'd lost it. It was a real decision time in my life. What kind of a person am I going to be? Am I going to take a 9 16 end wrench and lose my integrity? Or do I go buy another wrench to replace it? That was a big decision time. Well, needless to say, I didn't keep the wrench. But I wanted you to see, sometimes your integrity hinges on a little metal wrench, just like that. If you want to be successful in business, you can never lose your integrity. You've got to keep that integrity. You give good quality service. You treat your customers honestly. You treat your employees honestly. I'll give you an example. We, we ended up doing millions of dollars worth of work for these potato processing plants. As a matter of fact, we've had about 30 guys from our Manti operation helping the Idaho Barclay Mechanical to, uh, rebuild McCain's Foods up in Burley, Idaho this summer. And they constantly call us and we'll go from Washington to Oregon to North Dakota rebuilding potato processing plants. Before we went to Bulgaria to serve that mission, we finished a, a sweet potato french fry plant in, um, in, in Louisiana. I, it's either like Nestle or Hershey. It's like a chocolate name. But it's, it's there in Louisiana. So if you've ever had sweet potato french fries, that's, that's something that we've built the equipment for as well. The reason I wanted to take just a minute to teach you a little bit about the importance of integrity is why do you want to have your own business? So what are some advantages? Can you set your own hours? Mm, some businesses can. I can't. When the phone goes off and they say, our plants broke down, I need 10 men here in the next couple hours, I'm at their mercy. You know, some businesses can. So as you look at a business, 
and what you want to do, take a look at what demands you want on your time. Let me give you an example of the demands of your time. In 2007 and 2008, we were asked to come and help with a, an expansion, multi-million dollar expansion at the Holly Oil Refinery up there at 500 South, Bountiful, um, just on the west side of the road, that oil refinery. And they called us and asked us to design and submit proposals on how to run different piping systems. And do you know that year I put in over 3,250 hours? Now, let's just think for a minute. All right. Eight hours a day. Let's just go for 50 weeks in a year because let's say you have two weeks off for vacation. What's, what's eight, let's see, what's 40, what's 40 times 50? 2,000. So roughly 2,000 hours. That's if you don't take any holidays. You've got your two weeks paid vacation. But roughly, you're going to work, if you work for someone else, about 2,000 hours. Well, I put in over 3,000 hours. So that means I worked an extra seven months of a regular job in a year than normal. Does that make sense? I'm not bragging. I'm just trying to tell you, if you want to be an entrepreneur, it's not going to be easy. If you want to be successful, you've got to put in the time that it takes for that success. And sometimes the time that it takes means that you're sleeping four or five hours a night. And we had seven children. I tried my best to be the best dad that I could be, but I'll be right honest with you. I can't take very much credit for how great my kids are. They have a wonderful mother. So when you decide that you want to be an entrepreneur, it's extremely important that your partner, your spouse, that they understand the challenges and the sacrifices that you're going to make. Now that doesn't mean that we don't love it. We love it. It's exciting. We've had a wonderful life. We've been involved with a lot of tremendous, wonderful projects. And there's tremendous satisfaction to watch something that you've helped contribute to, to, to watch it become a reality. And so there's, I think, I'm a firm believer in, in someone owning their own business. Because nobody tells you if you're hired or fired. Nobody tells you the amount of hours you can work. Nobody tells you that you can or can't. You do it yourself. For example, if, you, if you're working for the Chevron Oil Company, okay, if they no longer need your services, you're gone. But if you are your own business man, if you own your own business, you're going to be out there finding the work. You can't take weeks off because you take time off and those people who are depending on you for work, now they're not going to have work. So I'm hoping that you're thinking this through. I'm just trying to plant just a few seeds, seeds in your mind. Does anyone have any question at this point? If not, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move ahead. So I've talked to you about the demands on your time. I've talked to you about integrity. Let me just share with you a couple of thoughts on that in terms of, of integrity and how you give people a fair price, fair service. Now, what is the most important thing in business? Have you ever heard the statement, the customer is the king? Okay, so if your customers aren't happy, how long is your business going to last? So, what are some things that you can offer a customer that would make him want to come back and do business with you? Quality, good quality, a fair price. Is price always the determining factor? No. Why, why do you say that? Okay. 
that's so true. And then you cause your customer problems as well. Just remember that. And you can write that in your notes. And I don't know exactly. I, I've heard this from others, and I probably won't say it right. But the sweetness of the price um, really becomes sour with poor quality. And just remember that. People will pay a little extra money to get what they want to have a good quality. And then also always remember to follow up. Let me just give you an example. We had bid a, a large project for the Holly Oil Refinery. And sometimes in these big projects, and with the scope of work, there can be tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of work that is not really designated who is in charge of it. So you've got to have really great communications. If I were to tell you anything, you've got to take some really good classes on communicating. So that for your own business, you've got to be able to verbalize and write down things. So every course that you're taking here at college, whether it's a literature class that helps you verbalize and articulate, everything is going to help you. I took a chemistry class at BYU and you know with chemistry when you're talking about things you're talking about different volumes and masses and just uh, inverting and multiplying so that you can change from cu cubic meters to square inches etc. I used that all the time in business. Um, one of my favorite classes that I took at BYU was, was family economics and home management and I, I told you five years ago, I was the only guy in that class with all the girls. And that was kind of fun, you know, before I met my wife, of course. <laughs> but I learned so much in that family economics class that helped me learn how to buy insurance. Learn, learn that term insurance can help you for a while and which types of insurance are best. Learning how to save money. Everything that you're learning everything you will use in your business. So I'd encourage you to get the very best education that you possibly can. Um, and if I could give you this advice, it would be don't lay on your bed when you study. When I started to study at the library, I found a quiet place at the library I would study, I would take my class, and then immediately after class, I would schedule an hour for homework. So when my class was done, I'd go to the library, quiet place, well-lit, comfortable place to sit, and I would do my homework. Then I would go take my next class and schedule some time off. You can't always schedule it that way, but if you'll schedule your time, where immediately after class you can do your homework. That way your homework doesn't all crowd you at the end of the week. You're doing your homework right after class. You will learn more, you'll remember more, and you'll get better grades. Just, just a thought. Because everything you're learning now will help you become a better businessman or businesswoman. Okay, let's see. I was going to switch gears just a little bit and tell you another story. Um, You've got to stay on the cutting edge of technology. Um, for example, my son Kenneth, he's uh, graduated from Utah State University and then he received his master's in engineering from the University of Utah. He came to me and said, Dad, we need to buy a new high definition plasma cutting table. And it was a quarter of a million dollars. And I'm the cheapskate, and my sons are the ones that are thinking in terms of leading edge of technology. And the three sons outvoted me because I said, ooh, can we find a good used one somewhere? That's me. I've always tried to buy as cheap as you can. I also want to tell you that do not go into debt if it's any possible way to not go into debt. If you have too high a debt load, you'll ruin yourself before you ever start. And so we as a business, once I paid that, I'll tell you, having a note at 12, over 12% 12 interest, if it teaches you one thing, and that is that your mortgage owns you. 
Your mortgage owns you, and you don't want that to happen. So we made up our minds that we wouldn't buy equipment until we had the cash to pay for it, if at all possible. And we've done that in every instance except a $3 million crane that we had to finance, um, which paid for itself in a year and a half, by the way. So if you get really good equipment that's top of the line, it'll pay for itself. So you have to stay on the cutting edge of technology. So you're going to want to go to trade shows or seminars. You never stop learning. I would always take classes um, to keep on top of what was happening in my industry. I, would, I, would, uh, I always was a member of the American Welding Society. I'd read that magazine. It talks about different equipment that's coming up, different processes, different gases that you could use with helium mixtures that would give you deeper penetration on welding. You've got to stay up to date on what's in your industry because it's so easy to become outdated and then lose your competitive edge. So you've got to, you've got to constantly be learning. Let's see. Okay, so we bought this plasma table, and I, my boys outvoted me. Next thing you know, we are cutting high-definition parts out, and that plasma table is running maybe six hours every day, and paid for itself in the first year, quarter of a million dollars. From then on, you're putting money in your pocket. So we liked that. We ended up buying a water jet high definition water jet. So with a water jet, you mix little tiny pieces of, of a, a silicone uh, sand and the water jet blows down at maybe 60,000 pounds pressure and those little tiny particles of sand being blown with the water. So you can cut through two inches of stainless steel with a water jet. We have three of those tables in Idaho and they're running 24 hours a day cutting all sorts of parts for other of our competitors. So stay on the leading edge of technology and don't be afraid. I, I think one of the first pieces of equipment that really converted my thinking was the Pipeworks welder. Now, who would spend close to $20,000 on a welder? a welding machine. Well, I did. Bought three of them. But you can weld and pass an x-ray with a pipe works, works welder, like a, let's say a six inch Schedule 80 pipe. Let's say it normally takes you from start to finish stick welding, let's say four hours. Okay, well you can do it in 30, 30 minutes with a pipe works welder. And if you're doing a thousand of those um, in a month's time, or two months time, can you see how soon it would pay for itself? So I think enough said in terms of staying on the leading edge. And, and you've got to know what's happening in your industry. And you can't, you can't tell that if you're not reading up or attending different seminars. So that would be important. Let's see, any questions? I'm gonna talk for 10 more minutes and then I'll take some questions. Okay. All right, I had a, one thing I was going to tell you that I thought was most important. Another thing that I think really changed us was when we started to working underground in the coal mines. Um, in the coal mines, if you kind of draw a little tic-tac-toe board out, that's generally the shape of the coal mines, so that they go in and they mine in north-south and east-west directions. Well, when you're bringing all the coal out and you need to change direction, you generally have to change at a 90 degree. And so you have to have some form of a collection chute with um, hard surfaced material so that it won't wear away to change that direction. And these are called transfer chutes. Well, we started working with an engineering company at the coal mine and with together, we were able to develop these um, sectional chutes 
so that we could build these sections in the shop. They could haul them into the coal mine and instead of spending $50,000 to set up these transfer chutes, you could build them and set them up for about ten or $15,000. And because you're constantly moving in the mines, depending on where you're mining, that, that became another big hit for us. So the other thing I wanted to mention is you've got to stay close with engineering companies that are designing things for your industry. You want to be with those that are forward thinking and not backward thinking. Otherwise, before long, your business is, you'll be in the past and you'll be left behind. Technology is extremely important. There were a couple of other thoughts that I, that I wanted to share with you. And that would be, for example, in the oil, oil refineries. Um, when you work in an oil refinery, which we do, safety is, is paramount. There are different gases that can escape. So you have got to, we had to, and we do, we send our, our workers through underground coal training every year. We send them to um, refinery training every year. They have cards. When they learn how to drive a forklift, they, they receive a little certification. When they learn how to drive a Class C truck, uh, then they have their little uh, chauffeur's license, etc. You never want to sacrifice safety for money. Does that make sense? Your, your employees have got to be trained in everything that you have them do. And they've got to be trained so that they understand the safe procedures. You can't put up with an employee who constantly violates your safety procedures. What will happen? Well, he could kill himself, he could hurt himself, but what's he going to do to others? In, in a business, your business is so dependent on the actions of everyone else, you need to consider proper training. And you want to be training them all the time. In our business, for a supervisor, we figure it costs us at least over $200,000. I, I just throw out a quarter of a million. Easily it takes that much money to get someone trained to be a supervisor. So if you're paying him $100,000 a year and someone comes and says, okay, I'll give him $105,000 a year, he'll be tempted to take another job. You've already put out a quarter of a million dollars to get him trained. Whoever hires him from you, he's not going to have to put out the quarter of a million. You already paid it. So you need to treat your employees fairly. And how can you do that? In our business, we took a certain percentage of the profits, the net profits, and then depending on how long a person had been there, depending on loyalty and so forth, we came up with formulas to where they received a portion of the profit. And that was very, that's worked for us very well to have some form of profit sharing. So that's something for you to keep in, in mind. You don't want to lose a good employee. So in order to keep an employee, you've got to treat them fairly, first with wages and safety, but there's other ways that you can reward them. For example, you can have an employee of the month or give little prizes for innovative ideas that they bring forth. But there is no substitute than to put your arm on someone's shoulder, tell them how much you appreciate them and how you appreciate their loyalty and their dependability. Your words mean easily as much as the dollars you're putting in their pocket. You can't complain about your employees to everyone and then expect your employees to be loyal to you. So your business is never any better than 
the people who work for you. So you want trained employees, safe employees, and happy employees. And you don't want to volunteer your employees' time because you appreciate your time with your family. They appreciate their time with their family. and They're going to sacrifice for you. In any business that you have, your employees, they will sacrifice. But try your best to reward them and try not to take advantage of them. That way it'll help you keep your employees happy. All right, are there any questions? We have 10 minutes or so that we could answer questions and my wife has the answers if I don't. Go ahead. Do you know, okay, how much is our company worth now as opposed to 10 years ago? I'm going to say three to five times as much. Probably three to five times as much. When we sold our company to our boys, our gross sales was anywhere between five to eight million gross sales. The first year we were in Bulgaria, it was 11, then the ne 11 million, the next year 12, and it's gone up. So I should have sold it to the boys a long time ago. Yeah, they've done, they've done really well. But one thing I, I did want to share with you is even our, my boys had an, an opportunity to test their integrity. Um, they had done a $400,000 project on P5 pipe, which is two and a quarter chrome. Uh, it takes special weld procedures. Our weld procedures qualified um, and are certified by ASME to work. But they had required that we purge those pipes with argon. We had purged them with some nitrogen mixture. There was not a problem. They'd passed x-ray. They'd passed every test. But when they asked one of my sons, did you purge that with argon? He said, no. We used this procedure. He could have lied and saved $400,000. I was so proud of him that he didn't. He told him, no, this is exactly what we did. We had to cut those pipes apart, reheat treat, we re-weld. $400,000. But he kept his integrity. The company that we did that work for, who do you think they want when they have a special project that they know that there's a contractor they can trust? They call him. Come right up. He's, he's earned the money back easily. You, you, but if you lose your integrity by, and in, in business, and maybe I've pounded that key too much, but I want you to know that that's your secret to your success is who you are. People learn to trust you. you that's your brand. And you just want to keep that. And you'll always do good if you're treating your people fairly, your employees and your customers. Any other questions? Go ahead. What kind of things did we fabricate? Well, I, I built a press that when um, Klepfer Concrete tipped over their dump trucks, I built a big press, hydraulic press, that I mounted inside the, the dump beds, and I'd push the sides back out after they were smashed. We relined trailers. We rebuilt trailers. Um, we built a little shakers and screens for gravel plants. And I even welded aluminum sprinkler pipe. The first Christmas we were in business, I got a call from Tyrone Phillips. He had 150 cows, Holstein cows, and his manure pump was broken down. And you know how they wash out the dairies into the pond? Some of you probably know. Well, when I got there to weld, I had been duck hunting a little earlier and I had my chest waders. I had to put my duck hunting chest waders on Christmas Day, walk out to manure almost up to the top of my chest waders, and I had to weld. I was getting shocked, too. Weld and stand in that deep in the manure, fixing their pump so that they could pump out all the manure from that dairy. So 
What kind of things did I do? Anything to feed all those kids and my wife. And I was grateful to have work. Any other thoughts? Go ahead. And then you... I try to save 10% all the time. N never spend everything that you make. Now, you're going to laugh at this. My brother told me he's a CPA. He's told me this years ago, and I, I've been repeating it because it sounds so ridiculous, but true. He says, you never go broke when you're making money. You just, just remember that. You've got to know and have good accounting to know what your costs are. And don't spend... Don't go out and buy a brand new house. Don't go out and buy a brand new truck. Think things over. Get by with good things. It was a while before we bought new things. I hate to tell you how many years we'd been married before we, had even, we bought new furniture. We lived with furniture and beds that our parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles had given us. We just got by. Yes, we have nice things now. But I, you have to delay the gratification of the new stuff for a while, or you'll get yourself in a real financial bind. Nathan, and then go ahead. So what was the thing that most motivated you from the start? I don't know if I can be honest, but I will. What was the most, uh, what, what motivated, me, motivated me the most? from the start till today. Well, when I first started, what motivated me was my wife reminding me that I hadn't brought a paycheck home for quite a while. And, and I've been feeding everybody on food storage. And I took this bolt of cloth to sew them all up clothes. Our kids looked like the Sound of Music kids, you know. <laughs> Where are all those kids? But our, that first Christmas I was telling you about, I had a bunch of pipe left over. So I made swing sets. I welded up swing sets from used pipes and monkey bars and teeter-totters. And my kids had a great time. It just took time. It didn't, it didn't cost money. Yeah, I think that the things that motivate me now I, is I, I, I enjoy the feeling of accomplishment. There is a tremendous feeling when a project comes to you that really requires you to think, just the satisfaction of knowing that, that, that you were able to get that done, it really drives you. You had a question? Okay, so the question is, what do you do with people who treat your equipment rough, maybe have some problems? What can you do? I'll tell you one thing we did. Twice a year, they had interviews. So I would, I would twice a year interview every employee. And um, my supervisors, we met every Friday. So every Friday or Monday morning, we would meet to plan out the, the following week. And so the biggest thing is you've got to communicate. And when you have an employee that constantly has trouble, you've got to get them the proper safety training. But some employees, you just have to let them go. But you don't, you don't want to let an employee go unless you've explained to him and then document. Every time you interview an employee, come up with your own little form, and you have to write down notes of what you talked about and you put that in their file. That's so important, especially with the litigious society that we have. You know, there are people who would sue you and say you didn't do something. So your notes that you take when you interview your employees, oh, they're so helpful to you, and they'll protect you. But beyond that, it helps them. So that the next time you interview them, you pull out your notes and say, okay, we were going to work on this. We were going to work on your safe driving. We were gonna, you were going to uh, take a course 
on economics or do you see what I mean? And then you can follow through. Probably have time for one more question. Oh, nope. no. Yeah, I don't want to fix that pretty hair. Yeah. Um, why did I sell my company in Idaho to the employees? The first two employees I hired, remember, that was, I was 26. One of them was uh, 19, just turned 19, and the other one had, was 17 and a half when I hired them, my very first two employees. And uh, they are such hard workers, and they were so loyal. And I just felt that they were the ones that deserved the first chance to buy it. And it's interesting because we still partner with them constantly and we work together on projects. And the real, the real reason why I sold is because it became too large for me to handle and my children at that time had no desire to work in the business. And I don't blame them. So I don't think I was probably the best dad. I tried the best I could, but you know, there's only 24 hours in a day and, and uh, sometimes you drink way too much Coca-Cola, Mountain Dew, and or Pepsi to keep your body moving when you shouldn't. Yeah. Thank you. All right, should we let him out early? <laughs> so I just wanted to ask him one question. What, what, what do you think is in the future for your business? Anything that's exciting or different that you think you might do more or just kind of the same you've been doing? As, as far as our business, a future, yeah. I think, think some things that will work well in the future are government contracts. So right now, the, like for example, supply chain, building parts, uh, high definition parts, for tanks, for rocket launchers, for planes. I think that there's a real good chance in our business to start landing governmental contracts. Well, let's give him another round of applause. Thank you. a uh, chair right here. Leave your attendance paper on that little chair right at that column as you're on your way out the door. Thank you.